Hello, welcome to Central Coast Primary Care, the webinar featuring Dr Julian Troller. Uh, my name is BJ Murray and I'm the team leader of the mental health programs here and one of those programs is Prima so you might recognise my name. So welcome. Um, I'm going to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we all meet on and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and we pay respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. So thank you for coming and I'll just do some brief introductions and some information that you'll need. Um, so I'd like to thank the PHN, the Primary Health Network, for collaborating um, with us on this webinar, uh, particularly Melissa Wilkinson for her help and support on the night. Um, Melissa is online and ready to troubleshoot any tech issues that you're having, so just email her via the contact that she gave in the reminder email if you're having any issues. Um, so thank you, Mel, for that. Another partner that we are working with to produce these series of webinars is the Central Coast Local Health District. And so a big thank you to them for their efforts in collaborating with the primary health sector. Particular thanks go to Jen McGee, who's here live in the CCPC website uh, boardroom with me. Um, and she is building networks and capacity for intellectual disability for our region and state. Um, for those with mental health issues. So thank you to Mel and Jen, um, who've been our support in our lead up. Um, so during the webinar, when we cross over to Dr. Julian Troller, um, Jen and I will be collating questions. So you'll see if everything's working okay on your end from the webinar, that you'll see that there's a chat box that you can um, put in questions live as you're thinking about them, so we don't lose that information. But what we'll be doing is just collating those questions and talking to Dr. Troller at the end of his presentation so we don't interrupt his flow and we use the best space of time. Some of the questions that you'll have might be answered during the webinar, so we will be looking at those, but just put them through um, as you think of them and we will be presenting those depending on time at the end of our webinar. Um, so that's that. Um, so we're just highlighting that this is the first um, webinar event that we're doing, but we're also planning webinar events for 2021. Um, so we'll host a number of these events over the next six months to increase knowledge around topics for individuals with disability and mental health concerns. Um, so the next topic is being delivered by Dr. Elizabeth Thompson. Um, she's a staff specialist at the Intellectual Disability Health Team and that title is Sex and Buzzwords. So hopefully that's going to grab your attention and that will come through um, via email from the PHN as well. Um, so a recording of this event will be available on PeopleBank um, and you can access that via the PHN networks that you normally have. Um, I know a lot of you have registered for PHN websites, webinars before, um, so that shouldn't be a problem, but if you're having any issues with that, don't hesitate to email the contacts. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr Troller. Um, Professor Julian Troller is a neuropsychiatrist and holds the inaugural chair of intellectual disability, mental health at the University of New South Wales. He also heads the Department of De Developmental Disability, Neuropsychiatry within the School of Psychiatry at UNSW. Julian is involved in diverse research programs, including ageing and cognitive decline in intellectual disability intellectual disability in the criminal justice system, human rights and healthcare in intellectual disability and ageing studies in the general population. So Julian is developing and delivering courses in mental health and intellectual disability and works with government departments at both state and federal level to improve capacity to deliver psychiatric services to people with an intellectual disability. And we're so pleased to have him here on the coast. So thank you, Julian. We'll cross over to you now. Thank you so much, uh, BJ, for your uh, organisation and, and that of Jen. It's a delight to be joining you uh, this evening. And uh, I thank all of those who uh, managed to join us. I'm just going to share my screen and uh, then we can uh, uh, join in. There we go. You should be able to see my slides now, hopefully. And uh, I'll be just working through uh, this issue of assessment and management of mental illness in people with intellectual disability, but also touching on 
some considerations that might be relevant to our COVID situation currently. Uh, just to begin with, I should disclose some funding sources. I receive core funding from New South Wales Health and obviously uh, all of our work is funded by external grants and project funding from a variety of sources, including the Australian government. And I thank uh, all of those agencies that have funded projects and that currently fund projects that enable us to do uh, the work. I'm encouraged by our wonderful team. These are some of our staff at 3DN. Uh, they're working in research and capacity building in disability healthcare. Uh, they're multi-skilled, multi-talented and from a variety of backgrounds. I'm actually the only medical practitioner among them. Uh, there are many psychologists and allied health uh, um, staff and also some from uh, data and statistics background. And uh, it's been a delight to be uh, leading that group. Tonight's learning outcomes uh, take us through identifying risk factors for common mental illness and people with intellectual disability, being able to describe the elements of treatment of common mental illnesses and when and how they should be used. We are going to touch on supporting people with intellectual disability to find their way through the mental health services system. And we're going to touch on this issue of COVID-19 in people with intellectual disability and understanding the risks and how we support people uh, at this quite stressful time for all of us. The first thing I think we need a grounding in is uh, a solid understanding of, a shared understanding of what in, is intellectual disability. It's certainly something that's fairly easy to define uh, as a, a, a situation where a person has below average intelligence, where they also experience deficits in adaptive functioning and where it has its onset during the developmental period, that is before the age of 18. But when we give that overly simplistic uh, definition, what we miss is the complexity and the diversity within that group. We also need to remember that there are lots of different historical terms that have been used uh, to describe the same thing. Many of you will come from an era, era as I do when the term used was mental retardation. That term is not used anymore. Uh, in the UK, there's a term learning disability, which is akin to what we know here as intellectual disability. Of course, here, if we refer to learning disabilities, we refer to a much broader group of individuals with a variety of learning uh, and uh, disabilities and intellectual disability. Um, we would include in that broader learning disability category here, uh, things like dyslexia. Uh, but in Australia, we don't use that term uh, to describe people with intellectual disability. What we must remember that no matter the term, we must remember that it's a person first with a disability. And often that's lost, I think, as we um, uh, use terminology to describe people. The diversity is clear when we consider that among people with intellectual disability, there's a really broad range of abilities ranging from those with mild intellectual disability who, whose needs are often catered for very well within our mainstream services through to those with profound disability. And you can see this graphic just shows you the uh, rough uh, um, way that these categories map onto uh, the intellectual quotient scores that are derived from standardised IQ tests bearing in mind that we don't diagnose intellectual disability solely on the basis of an IQ. You can see here that for moderate intellectual disability, the IQ on average is somewhere between 35 and 55. For those with severe intellectual disability, lower, and those with profound intellectual disability, much lower again. Intellectual disability is not particularly common only representing about 1.8% of the Australian population and a smaller number of those um, if, if you just uh, take a prevalence based on those who require services uh, for support. But what we do know is that even though it's a relatively small proportion of our total population, when we look at uh, those individuals who use services, we see here on this graphic that about 4% of all people using emergency departments, 
and um, inpatient non-mental health services are actually people with intellectual disability. And then when we look at the mental health compartments, about 6% of people using mental health services, just over uh, 6% uh, using inpatient mental health services are people with intellectual disability. So this instantly tells us that although we're dealing with a small proportion of the population, their health needs are quite significant and they're often people who present in the scene within our acute care services. If we contextualise that to Central Coast Local Health District, we can see that this graphic drawn from our uh, population-based data linkage shows that about 1% of all people living within the local health district have an intellectual disability, but they represent uh, just over 2% of the mental health population. We know that from our data linkage that those people have a median age of about 21 and that there's a, a slight predominance of males, about 60% are males. We know that uh, compared to uh, all people in New South Wales, people with intellectual disability in the Central Coast Local Health District have higher age standardised rates of presentation to the emergency department. And we know that uh, people living in the Central Coast District with an intellectual disability have higher rates of emergency department presentation than other people with intellectual disability living in New South Wales. And it's quite a considerable number of presentations that are about double that of the general population, so about 108,000 presentations per thousand people years. If we look at the admitted patient uh, categories, these are people receiving admissions, the mean length of stay for people with intellectual disability in the Central Coast is about four days. Uh, and that's slightly lower than the mean length of stay for people with intellectual disability in New South Wales. And we know that the mental health length of stay for people with intellectual disability is way higher than those receiving care for a physical health condition, uh, 14 versus three days. And we know that the admitted patient separations in an age standardised sense are higher uh, than that uh, for people with intellectual disability in New South Wales. We also know that the cost um, in Central Coast Local Health District is smaller than the cost uh, per admitted patient episode elsewhere in New South Wales. So it's quite helpful to think about that as we are uh, thinking about the way we're building capacity, how we use data uh, to inform uh, what we need to do. What about mental health? Well, firstly, we must put mental health within the whole of healthcare context. Firstly, people with intellectual disability experience multiple medical conditions, but only about half of those are under active management. We know that people with intellectual disability have, on average, about two and a half times the number of health problems as do the general population when you take into consideration age. Oral health is remarkably poor and there's less access to dental services. Dysphagia and reflux and chronic constipation are very common. Pneumonia, infections and aspiration are common, particularly in those with more severe disabilities. Metabolic and lifestyle related diseases are common. Things like thyroid disease, metabolic syndrome, overweight and obesity, poor diet, higher cardiometabolic uh, burden uh, is uh, a feature and people are less likely to meet recommended physical activity guidelines set by government. As well as this, we know people with intellectual disability in general have markers for premature aging. So osteoporosis is elevated in prevalence, frailty and multimorbidity is common, and frailty onset is on average about 25 years earlier than that of the general population. So you can think of a person on average a person with intellectual disability at age 50 will have the same frailty and multimorbidity as a person from the general population at age 75. Even things like dementia risk are increased, particularly for some groups, including those people with Down syndrome. Neuropsychiatric disorders are very common, including epilepsy. Um, autism comorbidity is common and things like tick disorders and drug induced movement disorders are increased in prevalence in this population. So coming back to then the very high mental health needs, uh, we know that people with intellectual disability do experience high rates for most common mental disorders, 
These rates are generally two to three times that of the general population. Things like schizophrenia, for example, has an earlier onset on average in people with intellectual disability. So what about the vulnerability to mental illness? You probably know from your uh, general understanding of mental health that the prevalence of mental health conditions in our general population is very high indeed. Two in 10 people experience a mental illness in the preceding 12 months when you look at population-based surveys. In people with intellectual disability, this has increased, as we've said, to somewhere between four to five in, in 10 people in the previous 12 months. So why is that? Why is the risk so high? I think we need to look at the whole person and a number of different factors to understand the risk. The first of these are social factors. Social isolation is relatively common. Communication difficulties are significant, particularly for people with more severe disabilities. There are fewer opportunities for engagement, partly because of the way our society uh, currently includes or excludes people with intellectual disability. People with disability may have fewer family and friends. They may be experiencing stigma and exclusion because of their disability. And this reduced social and interpersonal skills, which mean navigating the social sphere can become more complex with potentially more difficulty. Psychological risk factors are relatively common. Poor coping strategies can be evident. People can have experienced multiple negative life events, uh, have difficulty coping with stress and worry, may experience low self-esteem or lack of confidence, and may have some difficulty understanding and labelling emotions and understanding the emotional changes they're experiencing in response to events. They may also experience difficulty processing multiple sensory and mental stimuli. Of course, there are biological risk factors too. Uh, genetic risk factors uh, in some instances, for example, the located cardiofacial uh, syndrome is associated with a high risk of schizophrenia. Uh, and other changes in brain development or functioning can predispose some of those through pathways such as development of epilepsy. Physical disability may compound mental health, pain and illness may also, and medications and their side effects can also be triggers for mental ill health. Sensory impairments are relatively common and may also feed into that cycle. A person with intellectual disability is also someone who may be at more risk of and vulnerable to the effects of things like bullying, neglect and abuse. And we know that uh, neglect and abuse rates are very high in this population in general. People may not be able to express and manage their feelings of grief due to reduced cognitive abilities and may have greater experience, uh, greater likelihood of experiencing unwanted life changes, for example, changes in accommodation or living situation, such that someone is all of a sudden in a position where they're um, living with someone uh, where, where in, in the instance they were given a choice, they may choose to live with um, other people. There are lifestyle risk factors, as we've already said, uh, in terms of less engagement in exercise, which is a known buffer against mental health, difficulty sleeping, and a person with intellectual disability is also more likely to have had contact with the justice system, both as a victim and as an offender. And also there's a greater effect from drugs and alcohol uh, as cognitive function uh, is lower. There are environmental risk factors that we've touched on, living situation, financial difficulties, support staff and organisational changes and policies which may not support mental health and poor socioeconomic status, which possibly explains quite a considerable uh, amount of the variance in uh, prevalence of uh, poor health outcomes and uh, mental ill health. So all of this means that our approach to uh, assessment and management of people with intellectual disability who are experiencing mental health needs to be quite sophisticated. And here what I want to describe are some of the key elements that I think are helpful as you go forward in that uh, long-term professional learning in this area. The first thing I want to describe is baseline and its value in our assessment of mental health. Baseline refers to well-being and how it's expressed, knowledge about the physical health status of the person, their usual cognitive abilities and how these are exercised, their behavioural profile and responses and 
their functional abilities. If we know these things about a person, we're in a far better position to judge changes from baseline, which may tell us something about the person's physical or mental well-being. Here I've listed some of these in more detail. So the range of emotions, how they're expressed and in what situations they're usually expressed. The key relationships and how a person relates to those people. The physical health and how they impact on the person's level of activities, including things like side effects from medication, restrictions due to medical conditions, the disability related to additional medical burden. Routines and rituals and how these are usually uh, patterned for the person and how they respond if there's a disruption to the pattern. What the person eats and drinks, how much, their preferences, how they access that food, their degree of uh, uh, inclusion in choices. Communication style and any aids they may use, regular hobbies they engage in and things that uh, really encourage them to do that. The social interactions and activities, the personal hygiene habits and assistance a person may require and what happens to their personal hygiene when they're stressed or unwell, sleeping habits and the same, how they change when the person is unwell or stressed, and usual activity level, for example, regular sport and how they typically run their day and take part in activities. Now, there are many different sources of these in, this information about baseline. Some of it is collated for us and we only need to ask for the, that source. A good example is uh, people with intellectual disability commonly collate these in a resource folder themselves. And this is one, uh, one that is uh, a uh, a, a um, so struggling with my words, it's quite uh, uh, late in the day. This is one that is uh, directed and managed by the person with intellectual disability themselves. It's called My Health Matters and it's been produced by the Council for Intellectual Disability. It's designed for the person with intellectual disability to bring to their doctor and it contains a wealth of information about the person's baseline. Another one that's often used within an inpatient care context is the admission to discharge together folder. Uh, this is one that is, has multiple inputs, including by a person with disability, that tells you a lot about the person, their preferences, and their usual patterns of behavior and activity. My health record is another important source of information that we um, often don't connect with the rest of the information we're gathering. And the Comprehensive Health Assessment Program, known as the CHAP tool, is a really valuable source of information because often this is done annually for people and filed away in the health folder that accompanies the person. So knowing what is their baseline health uh, and when it was last assessed is very important. We've also produced a wellbeing record at 3DN, which is a resource about the person that can be used by the person or their carers and this can be then presented to health professionals who are the main ones who interact with the resource. And it tells the person about the baseline for the person with disability and any changes that are occurring can be filled out later so that when a person comes to the attention of a, a medical practitioner, bringing both the baseline wellbeing record and the changes section, if it's filled out, is a very useful way to convey how things are different to the per for the person. And this can give us clues about the nature of the person's uh, physical or mental ill health. And this is uh, some of the information that we collate in the booklet. It's freely available on our website and you're welcome to download it and use it. And there are very detailed instructions on how to do that and how to uh, fill it out. There are various sections on normal wellbeing, et cetera. So how does knowing about baseline assist with your assessment? Well, it assists in so many different ways. Uh, firstly, what we need to think about is um, just generally uh, what we know about basic function, what's healthy and normal for the individual. Usually this is gathered incidentally, but uh, for people with mild to moderate levels of intellectual disability, baseline has many similarities to someone without intellectual disability, but it varies and is unique to the individual. So having a detailed knowledge of the person's baseline will actually help us. 
it becomes increasingly important for people with more severe levels of disability or where there's complexity, where there are limited communication skills or comorbid autism. And their baseline functioning and behaviour is unique to each individual. There's very little commonality between uh, from person to person. So knowledge of the person's unique baseline is absolutely critical to recognising presentations of a, a mental illness or indeed of a medical um, uh, urgent condition. When we think about presentations of mental illness, uh, we know these generally involve changes in the thought content, thought form, emotional changes that may be expressed and changes in behaviour and functioning. And so many of these things, when it, you put it in a context of a person with intellectual disability, uh, will be evident. Changes in thought content and communication, changes in thought form, but there'll be an increasing evidence on ch uh, emphasis on change in behaviour and functioning. And so knowing about baseline will really help us. Knowing how the situation is different and behaviour and functioning is changed will also be of value but it'll become increasingly important in those with more severe disability where there's an even greater emphasis on changes in functioning and behaviour and observed signs of uh, a mental illness rather than waiting or expecting a person to be able to communicate those things to you verbally. Now, if we're reliant on verbal expression of mental distress, uh, we're going to miss a lot. And so what we must uh, realise is that sometimes the changes that we see uh, that manifest as observed behaviours might not necessarily be instantly recognisable unless we are monitoring carefully for it. So an example could be uh, the expression of grandiosity in a manic phase of bipolar disorder can actually appear quite mundane uh, if you think of it at face value. For example, imitating a staff member doing what the staff member is doing uh, in their day shift or talking about driving when the person doesn't actually drive. But for a person with a severe level of intellectual disability or even a moderate and lower moderate level of intellectual disability, those can be quite unrealistic expectations. When pacing or throwing furniture might be interpreted as an expression of anger or anxiety, it could also be for example, that the person is experiencing mania. So knowing what the person's general demeanour is like and knowing how they might express their frustrations and distress and anger normally when in a uh, euthymic mood might really help you uh, to clue into this as a manifestation of mania. And sleep may be more um, or less um, in various mental illnesses but sleeping more and being less interested in normal activities can sometimes be interpreted as just relating to the disability and reduced cognitive capacity, when in fact it could be an important manifestation of something like depression in a person. So we mustn't assume that we know, we must always know uh, that we know and know the baseline for the person. We also uh, sometimes get confused because behaviours that might seem to indicate a mental illness can actually have other causes. A simple example is that for some with intellectual disability, there's a quite an unusual response to stress. And so that may just re reflect a unique coping uh, style for the person, but it can be interpreted incorrectly as being quite bizarre or psychotic. For example, if a person is responding to a stressful event with agitation and giggling, uh, obviously, uh, that could be misinterpreted and it could be assumed that the person is experiencing hallucinations or they're experiencing psychotic symptoms. Sleep disruption, reduced activity, increased agitation can be due to pain or discomfort from a medical condition rather than depression or anxiety. Uh, someone may be just expressing their preference uh, to not engage in acti activity and refusing to uh, go to that activity simply because it's a choice. Uh, rather than it being a symptom of withdrawal in depression. And a person may appear to have depression or even dementia syndromes as a result of a medical condition, which, uh, for example, uh, underlying hypothyroidism. So just as for the general population, increased crying and sleeping problems can be related to grieving, uh, and this can include uh, loss of a close friend, uh, through not just through death, but, for example, someone who's moved out or a co-worker who's left their job or indeed a staff member who's left a support circle for the person.
So let's move on to practical considerations for consultation. The first thing I think we need to do is prepare for the consultation. So we need to find out uh, the person's needs, mobility and sensory needs, their communication methods and their level of independence. And so some of this is about baseline again. We need to make sure we're booking extra time for the person to build rapport. We need to consider longer appointments or even breaking things up so we have two appointments within fairly quick succession to gather all of the information and appropriately uh, help the person. We need to make sure we have a simplified appointment and referral letter and use easy read information. If you don't know what that is, there's some good guidance on the Council for Intellectual Disabilities website or on Scope Victoria's website about easy read and making your communications accessible to people with limited literacy. We need to consider home visits and if this isn't possible, uh, we need to consider how we modify our clinic environment or create lower levels of stimulation in the environment to be more suitable for a person with disability. Uh, and ahead, we also need to try and seek consent to access other relevant health records if those, that information hasn't already been provided. And we need to avoid cancelling at short notice. During the consultation, if possible, avoid long waiting times because this is really difficult for a person with disability. It's difficult for all of us. It's especially difficult if you have limited understanding of why that's occurring. We need to try and review the person in a setting that's familiar, for example, their home, school or day centre. We need to consider uh, reduction in stimulation, a quiet waiting area, seeing the person in a fairly low stimulation uh, place with limited uh, equipment around that could be perceived as threatening or could be a distraction, or in fact could be um, uh, something that the person may gravitate to and, and use. We need to greet the person and speak to them directly. And if a family member or support person is present, check uh, if the person with intellectual disability is happy for them to be involved and to what extent they're happy for them to uh, be involved. As we go through the consultation, there are several important concepts that we need to keep in mind. The first and very important one is called diagnostic overshadowing. Now, behavioural change is a very common reason for presentation to the uh, emergency department and mental health services and to general practice. In fact, emotional and behavioural changes in our own research are the most common reason uh, for presentation to general practice. Diagnosis of a serious mental health issue, though, can be missed if the behaviour is just assumed to be due to the intellectual disability itself. And where that uh, miss occurs, we refer to this as diagnostic overshadowing. So really not seeing what's underneath because all we're seeing is the disability itself. And in some ways, this stems from a long held assumption that if you had an intellectual disability, maybe you couldn't experience uh, mental ill health or mental distress which simply isn't the case. In fact, we now know that our prevalence is much higher, and the risks are much higher for this group. But that used to be a, a long held dogma that really didn't do people with intellectual disability any service in terms of helping support mental uh, health. And it can lead to diagnose, under diagnosis and under treatment. So no matter what's going on, we must always conduct a thorough assessment, uh, physical and mental health assessment, where there's been a change in the person's behaviour. You know, there can be tragic consequences and I've been involved from time to time in uh, understanding and picking apart tragic outcomes, uh, including those in emergency departments when people present with changes in behaviour that are dismissed. And on occasions, uh, tragic outcomes occur where physical health conditions or other conditions are overlooked. Uh, and people die, unfortunately, as a result. So we must make sure that we afford the person a very comprehensive assessment. Now, we all must, also must take uh, uh, account of complexity. So assessment and diagnosis can be complex due to all sorts of reasons, but uh, the level of intellectual disability, uh, complexity such as other uh, both medical conditions and uh, sensory disabilities, and uh, comorbid conditions such as autism spectrum disorders, and also uh, the polypharmacy experienced by the person. So this level of complexity means that we must have a much more detailed level of assessment. 
We know also that there's a strong link between physical health and mental ill health. Uh, so medical conditions and medications may actually be driving some of the changes in mental health that we see. Uh, and in fact, uh, some uh, side effects to medication can also mimic psychiatric disorder. So you can become amotivated and experience sedation, which could look like withdrawal, uh, but in fact, uh, as part of depression, but in fact, that could be just due to a medication side effect. So we need to be switched on to the medication profile and interaction profile as well. Polypharmacy is very common uh, in people with disability. We also need to know uh, that certain syndromes are associated with uh, psychiatric and medical conditions. So a simple example, Fragile X syndrome is associated with um, higher rates of autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, hyperactivity, ADHD, and so on. We also need to know uh, that um, bringing to, we need to bring to bear more so in people who are complex knowledge about baseline. Now, presentation uh, may vary greatly across contexts. So we need to gather information in that situation about in which situation is the change or changes evident. Is it home, day program, time spent with specific people or in specific places in order to understand the extent of the problem? I, we need to identify the causes of changes in behaviour and functioning, uh, but these are more complex uh, when there are multiple challenging areas. Uh, so this will mean we'll have to take time uh, to do the assessment uh, and uh, do it more thoroughly than normal. And we must also collect information on all relevant dimensions. And much of this is um, assisted by our sound uh, awareness of baseline for the person. But some things, for example, chasing developmental history, particularly in people who are in their ad adult years, can be difficult and challenging, but we must try and piece it together bit by bit so that we've got that understanding of baseline or optimum for the person. One of the things we know is that certain genetic causes of intellectual disability are also associated with very particular behavioural phenotypes. So these are certain characteristic patterns of behaviour or vulnerabilities to mental ill health. So be, being familiar with some of these things help us in understanding Another simple example is Prader-Willi syndrome associated with poor impulse control, difficulty with satiety, obsessions and compulsions and poor control over emotions, including anger. One source of information is from the study at the Society for the Study of Behavioural Phenotypes, SSBP, and this is a great website because it's got a series of fact sheets on different syndromes and I'd encourage you to look at that. We must remember that in some instances, people present with atypical syndromes because of the level of complexity and because of uh, the behavioural and other um, issues in the person. So uh, we know that mental ill health manifestations might, are more likely to be atypical, partly because the person isn't expressing them in the usual verbal way, uh, but also because of those other levels of complexity issues we've worked through. So observation can be a very important tool and we must, um, if we're not sure what the issue is for the person, we must be prepared to embark on a data collection uh, and um, a good collation of the observations about the person can really help us uh, to resolve the ambiguity in the presentation. Uh, many of these records are um, able to be constructed and administered and uh, monitored and then collated for you uh, through the person's uh, behaviour support practitioner. Uh, because often when a person is complex, uh, they already have an existing behaviour support plan and a practitioner that's involved in helping support the person. So we can ask for certain extra data to be added to that collection that will help your assessment. There are many uh, assessment tools that can be helpful in assessing mental ill health in people with intellectual disability. Some of them have been contextualised specifically for people with disability. Some of them are self-reports and some of them are informant reports. And I just point you to a comprehensive resource in which we catalogue these uh, in a series of downloadable PDF files uh, in this resource. And it's available through our website at UNSW. Uh, it's um, best seen in the toolkit that we developed as part of the core competency manual and framework uh, a couple of years back.
There are diagnostic manuals that have been contextualized for people with intellectual disability. These are two of them, the, the DMID uh, version two and the DC or Diagnostic Criteria for Learning Disability, which is a little older, but still quite valuable in terms of reading through to show you how experts um, alter or modify diagnostic criteria uh, when they're approaching people with intellectual disability. I think this one, because it's the most recent, is a really useful textbook, the DMID2. So after we've done our assessment, it may need to be repeated if the presentation was ambiguous and with extra data that you've requested. We may need to chase that missing information from family, support people, other services, allied health and other assessments that have occurred in the past and from schools and educational uh, assessments and settings. We need to communicate with the person with an intellectual disability and their family and support networks about the preliminary outcome. In my own clinic, it's not uncommon for me to be CCing about six recipients of a comprehensive clinic letter and keeping everybody in the loop and connected is so critical, particularly when things like NDIS don't necessarily uh, fund to an adequate level the coordination of overall supports for the person. We must make sure that our communication is effective uh, within uh, the mental health and medical sphere. And we must also take time to uh, involve the person with disability in treatment choices, taking them through what those choices are and the pros and cons associated with um, each of those. So what about the basics of treatment? <clears throat> well, the first is uh, to be guided uh, by some principles. And one of those is uh, a recovery-oriented framework and a person-centred approach. We must ensure that we encourage uh, the person to take as much responsibility for their lives as possible. We must try and plan uh, with the person and those around them uh, to devise a comprehensive care plan. And this uh, needs to be thought of not just as dealing with the immediate issue, but a range of caveats, because sometimes uh, planning, despite the best planning and immediate response to the situation, the situation can change, it can escalate, uh, and that can occur relatively quickly. So it's very helpful not just to think about what's currently presenting in front of you, <clears throat> but to think about arming the person and those who support them with uh, crisis strategies. Okay, let's work through this scenario. What happens if? And let's work through uh, the overall journey um, with time. Okay, what happens in uh, once we've dealt with the acute phase of treatment? What are going to be the ongoing management strategies that are going to help mitigate against uh, the likelihood of uh, mental ill health um, being a feature in the future. Psychological intervention is the first line for mild depression and anxiety, and uh, they're adjunctive in more severe disorders. And there have been a variety of techniques that have been modified for use with people with disabilities. Some of these are behavioural therapies, which are quite common. Uh, some of them are more complex cognitive behaviour therapies, and these can be very useful, uh, but need to be simplified. And there are various um, ways of doing that. Most good clinical psychologists should be able to adjust their practice uh, to administer cognitive, a modified cognitive behaviour therapy for a person. DBT or dialectic behaviour therapy can be particularly helpful for those with personality disorders. And other therapies can sometimes be important, particularly uh, family systems therapies, and other forms of uh, family intervention, particularly to aid a family and the person with disability in managing transitions or where a person uh, may experience significant distress uh, when they're trans transitioning from the family home to independent living. We have some uh, guidance in our um, resources about modifications to psychological therapies, and you can find them again in our competency framework and tool toolkit. What about pharmacotherapy? Well, it's quite common for psychotropic medicines to be inappropriately prescribed, so without a core indication, um, and off-label use of psychotropic medications is quite common. We know that polypharmacy uh, is common in our own research that's been demonstrated both for people with intellectual disability and those on the autism spectrum, 
And anecdotally in clinic, it seems to me that treatment is often prolonged and not not the the justification for its uh, continuing is is often not um, revisited on a regular basis as we would with a person without intellectual disability. We just assume that they'll continue to need it. And so through the life course, a person may accumulate a plethora of uh, different medications. And that can lead to many problems for a person, particularly as they are aging or becoming frail. Nevertheless, pharmacological interventions are indicated as a primary treatment in many uh, mental disorders. And we must use principles that are just the same as the general population uh, when we're approaching this issue. Um, there are numerous resources. I'd like to just draw your attention to this one and you'll have the slides and you can click through. This is just an article we wrote for Australian Prescriber that outlines the process of uh, what you need to consider when you're prescribing in this context. Uh, we've produced uh, a number of podcasts with experts uh, uh, um, including people with disability, talking about guidance uh, both for adults and for children and adolescents. Um, and so there's a series of eight podcasts linkable through our um, website. And there are also resources to help you manage cardiometabolic risk in the context of prescribing. And again, there's a link here to the resource on our website. But let's look at prescribing in a little more detail. The first thing we need to do is think, is a prescription warranted? Do we have a primary diagnosis of mental illness for which psychotropics are the appropriate treatment? Or do we have a situation where we have challenging behaviour that's so severe and non-responsive to maximised treatments uh, that are non-drug treatments and is significantly impacting the person or is a risk issue? And does the evidence uh, that benefit uh, of potential benefits outweigh the risks or potential risks associated with the treatment? Uh, if the answer is yes, then we proceed to develop a treatment plan. We must make sure that we have a clear idea of what we're targeting, uh, the symptom, how its baseline frequency and intensity, and how you're going to measure that. Because what you need to know is, is this medication making a difference? You'll only know that if you've got really good baseline information about those target symptoms or behaviour that you then monitor carefully. Uh, we must make sure that all prior assessments of the medical and other uh, psychiatric and functional causes of the symptom have been addressed, that we've done a thorough assessment to exclude alternative causes. We must make sure that we know about the uh, previous response to treatments, including side effects, and we must have a clear timeline of treatment trial, and we must consider it a trial. We're not starting behaviour, uh, not starting medication and then um, just letting it run. We are initiating a treatment trial. We must also consider when choosing the medication, medical comorbidities and potential interactions. So many syndromes have an increased risk of cardiometabolic um, uh, dysfunction, or respiratory uh, difficulties, including aspiration or dementia, and we need to avoid medications that will worsen that. An additional, additional consideration is around epilepsy. Often a person with intellectual disability will have epilepsy and many psychotropic medications reduce seizure thresholds, so we need to be careful. We need to take into account the person's wishes and those who support them and whether or not they could adhere to monitoring. For example, if a person uh, can't tolerate a blood test, it's very difficult to administer a drug such as lithium or clozapine because both of those um, drugs require regular blood monitoring. It's impossible, in fact, and it would be dangerous to do so. We must take into account uh, swallowing or absorption impairments for the person. This may be a feature when someone has a peg uh, inserted. Uh, we may also need to know about a previous positive response, including and, and side effects and co-prescribed medications. And we must uh, also, when we're commencing the treatment, make sure we involve the person, um, educate them on how to do that, obtain baseline data on monitoring risk and side effects, and commence low and go slowly with the titration. In monitoring the treatment, we must engage the person, review regularly uh, to assess for side effects, watch for sudden behavioural changes after initiating treatment, 
A simple example would be I'm starting a serotonin reuptake inhibitor uh, and uh, I've done that and the person's agitation has gone through the roof suddenly. Because some of these things can engender anxiety on initial starting, particularly if they started at conventional doses. When we're discontinuing treatment, as we inevitably will, because some medication trials will be ineffective and others will be no longer needed, we must consider um, doing this very carefully because discontinuation can be problematic and can induce side effects in, in their own right. Uh, once again, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor is a classic example, but even other things like antipsychotic treatments that have been administered long term in their withdrawal, particularly if it's a rapid withdrawal, you can induce uh, things such as withdrawal dyskinesias and withdrawal akathisia. So these things need to be tapered slowly. When should I seek a specialised review? This is a common question uh, that comes up. Well, we're really fortunate in New South Wales to have an ever increasing range of services, both within local health districts, primary health networks, and also at a statewide level uh, that enable us to uh, refer people for a more specialised review if we're not sure. Well, when should we do that? I think when symptoms don't get better, when they worsen despite treatment, when the presentation is complex and we're not sure how to proceed, and the nature of the problem may be um, unclear despite our thorough initial assessment, or when we think the treatment requires more specialised psychotherapeutic or pharmacological skills than we possess, where there's a deterioration or an unexpected cause, and where there's a continuing high risk to the person despite treatment. For example, the person continues to have very high level self-harming behaviour or is expressing suicidal ideation or behaviours. Let's move on to the latter part of the talk, and this is about COVID-19 considerations. We all know the uh, tragic uh, story of COVID-19, and these are just uh, some of the um, statistics from our world in data. You can see the United States uh, cases are approaching uh, you know, huge volume at the moment, but the new average daily confirmed cases is right up here with India. And we know that the total uh, confirmed cases in the US is approaching 7 million as we speak. These statistics are from the weekend. Um, actually, there was something I just wanted to show you here. You're probably also aware that uh, the rate of testing um, determines how many people we know have uh, COVID-19. And the positive test rate gives you some indication of how many tests are being done relative to the number of people who have, the, have COVID-19. So you see Australia quite comfortingly has a very low positive rate of tests. Uh, the US is uh, much higher and some countries are much higher again. For example, Indonesia claims not to have nearly as many cases as some other countries, but actually the testing rate is quite low. So the uh, percent of positive tests is very high indeed. Case fatality rate in Australia is uh, relatively uh, good compared to some other countries, around about 3%. But what about COVID-19 and people with intellectual disability? Well, at the start of all of this, uh, people with intellectual disability were only slowly recognised to be a vulnerable group, uh, as were people with disability as a whole. And they were often not included in the initial initiatives which focused naturally on the aged care sector and other vulnerable populations. But as we said before, people with disability have frailty that's brought forward. And so we must consider uh, people with intellectual disability the vulnerable population as a whole, not that everyone is vulnerable, but many are. A simple example of how that has unfolded is that the case rate has been way up. So the per person with disability has been vulnerable to infection and mortality has been way up. Uh, twofold that of people without intellectual disability in New York State. And mortality rates elsewhere have also been significantly elevated above the general population. So why are people uh, vulnerable at this time? Well, they're vulnerable because they often have the complex comorbidities we've referred to and the pre-existing health conditions. They may be at higher risk of acquiring COVID-19 and of poor health outcomes associated with it may be more vulnerable to the effects of, on mental well-being from COVID 
and need reasonable adjustments to be made to ensure that they can access healthcare. Importantly, we must also recognise, given the high health needs of this group, that we need clear pathways to support ongoing treatment of known health conditions or health assessment where a person has a new onset condition, as we know these will occur more often than in the general population. What about mental ill health in this context? Mental illness and behaviours of concern can arise and there have been a plethora of them in people, particularly those with more severe disabilities. Individual risk factors are present um, and these will be associated with a higher likelihood of developing mental illness or distress associated with COVID-19 context. Severity of disability, the presence of autism, age, experience of abuse, pre-existing mental health issues and behaviours of concern all contribute but so too does a difficulty adjusting to disruption of routine. It can be incredibly difficult for people to um, understand why things need to change and to engage in risk reduction strategies. This can be incredibly confusing. I'm told suddenly that I can't um, get near people and show my usual way uh, the, in, and display my affection in the usual kind of way. I can't relate to those that I love in the usual kind of ways. I can't see them as has occurred because uh, my group home or my living situation has determined that I need to minimise my contact with others. So this has presented a major problem for the disability sector uh, and this has been uh, a challenge, I think. So we've seen many people experience distress at this point. We also know that the information about COVID um, and uh, the opportunity to express uh, the um, distress that we've all felt has been somewhat difficult for this population. So what should we do? Well, we must make sure we provide a positive, um, um, proactive uh, communication with people with disability uh, and those who are supporting them. We, if we um, have people with intellectual disability on our books, making sure that we are checking in, making sure people's mental health is okay, and ensuring know, that people know how and when to access mental health and behavioural supports during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, the awareness of things like telehealth has been, and, and the um, increased use of that has been very important in that process. As well, we must make sure that the person's mental health care plan is up to date and make sure that we refresh that information for the person, their family and those who are supporting them so that they know how and when to get help if a problem arises. We also need to make sure that whilst people um, access information about COVID uh, at this time, that we don't overwhelm people. So it's a good strategy sometimes to focus um, only occasionally on the news items and to update people intermittently and not, for example, look at all of the uh, terribly distressing news day after day uh, because that can just overwhelm a person. There are some really positive stories about coping with the pandemic and recovery, and I think they're ones to focus on. And ex ex allowing the person to express their feelings uh, and checking their understanding and use of social stories and materials that help guide them through the COVID situation at their own pace are incredibly helpful. And there are many uh, good websites uh, where you can access that information. And maintaining usual routines as long as they're aligned with COVID safety precautions, incorporating new activities which reinforce COVID prevention methods and continuing connection with loved ones in whatever way that is possible is really important. Getting exercise, healthy eating and addressing sleep routines is particularly important. So should we um, approach this situation uh, and prescribe medications when we see a person who's distressed? Well, the simple answer is probably not in the first instance. We need to make sure that uh, we make sure that the person has good access to psychological treatments and environmental strategies in the first instance, but if a more severe mental illness arises, we proceed as we would in any other situation. For escalations of behaviour, the primary way of addressing these are through behaviour support plan, or if a person doesn't have one, we must advocate for that to be provided to the person. 
Uh, and we must make sure that not only does a person have a plan in place, but it's active and there's active input from the behaviour support specialist supporting both the person with disability and the staff uh, or family who may be trying to support them. We need to try and avoid initiation or escalation of psychotropics for behaviours in the absence of underlying mental health concern. Uh, because that doesn't uh, represent best practice. In fact, there is very little um, evidence that psychotropic medication is effective for behaviours in the absence of mental ill health. We must make sure that the person can continue to access their appropriate therapy services and medications where they're uh, necessary and make sure that we use the telehealth item numbers um, appropriately. There is really good advice on uh, COVID for people with disability and those who support them. And these are a couple of websites. At the beginning of all of this, and, um, I coordinated a series of uh, development of a series of fact sheets uh, for people with disability, families, uh, health care providers and mental health professionals. And these are on the uh, Department of um, Health's website, main um, Commonwealth Department of Health, and, along with a whole range of resources uh, for the health and aged care sector. Um, there's also, um, we advocated that a uh, health uh, professionals disability advisory service uh, should be started. And this is uh, a telephone service designed to give health professionals advice on how to proceed uh, in the COVID context with tricky health related concerns in people with disability. Uh, this is a very good line that is staffed uh, by um, a uh, series of experienced call handlers who can connect the caller through to a disability health expert, a uh, health professional who's uh, an expert across um, the country. So this is a very valuable service. Now, I'd just like to finish, I'm aware that we're um, now out of time, uh, with review of a couple of new resources that we've uh, developed and launched. I mentioned the core competency framework earlier, so I won't review that further but some new tools. Recently, we released an app, a web app called MySigns, which allows a person with disability and those who support them to collate a whole wealth of information about how they normally communicate so that when they're with a mental health clinician who may not know the person uh, very well, they know how they are expressing their emotions and uh, also so that a collation of um, that information can occur over time allowing the mental health clinician to know how the person is tracking. This is free to use. Um, it's an app that we're encouraging um, uh, people with disability and those who are supporting them to sign up to. And you can invite the mental health professional and give them access to the information for the person. And it's a series of uh, pictorial representations of the person with a, a cataloging by the person who's uploading them. They can be photographs or videos, and these can be very helpful during the mental health consultation. And if you want further information, you can have a look at what that looks like on our, our website. We're about to launch a series of easy read resources for mental health services. These are particularly useful for local health districts because they take all of the standard information we give to people during their hospital stay and hospital journey um, and they, we've put them into an easy read format, so a pictorial format that can be discussed with the person or read by the person if they have some limited literacy. Uh, these are extensive, there are multiple resources, and they're going to be uh, soon released, so look out for them. They cover navigating the mental health services sector and questions to ask, knowing about the Mental Health Act, community treatment orders, and the role of family and friends and official visitors, easy read summaries of the statement of rights documents and orientation to inpatient mental health services. So uh, what you can expect, what your rights are as an inpatient. Uh, and some of these are in modifiable templates that um, other primary health networks can use. They've been tried and tested, developed with people with disability with extensive input uh, from the sector. We've also just released in the last couple of weeks an ID health data portal, taking our link data across the state and returning it in the way of an interrogable data portal uh, to local health districts. We've written to all chief executives um, in New South Wales and provided uh, information about the health data portal. 
and we're asking for the chief executives to nominate key local health district staff to access this information. This gives invaluable information about the profile of people with disability within the local health district, how people are presenting to emergency departments, inpatient stays, to ambulatory mental health services, the diagnostic profile of people with disability in your local health district and length of stay. And those statistics can be compared to other similar local health districts and to the state average. I'd also just like to emphasize the value of looking at our free e-learning resources. We have multiple modules for health professionals, for disability professionals, for families and carers of people with disability. These are just some of the uh, module courses. Each of these dot points represents uh, an individual module and the bold uh, a particular um, course. These are currently free. The ones for disability professionals are soon not going to be free. Uh, because we are embarking on a commercialisation in order to make ends meet and ensure we can continue to develop new content. And finally, uh, a recently launched um, treatment tool, Healthy Mind. Uh, this is primarily developed by the Black Dog Institute, but in collaboration with us, this is a treatment resource for people with intellectual disability and borderline levels of disability who may experience mild anxiety and depressive symptoms. So it's a free online treatment program. There's a companion study. We're looking at the effectiveness of uh, this uh, platform in treatment. And so if you've got people who you think uh, can access this either alone or with support, so the idea is that you can do it yourself in a self-directed way if you're uh, literate on the internet, or if you would like someone to guide you through it, you can do it with someone who supports you and you can enrol uh, in that way. So in conclusion, providing appropriate mental health care to a person with intellectual disability means knowing about the barriers people might experience to accessing care, working in partnership with people with disability and those who support them, understanding the vulnerability to mental ill health, and the assessment uh, and drivers of behavioural change, um, making sure you keep abreast of your knowledge in the area and develop skills in mental health assessment and treatment, particularly knowing that people are going to present often um, and being aware of resources that can assist you in that uh, professional development. Um, so I'll, I'll finish at this point and I think I'm hoping there'll be uh, some questions that we can discuss. Thank you, Dr. Dossida. That was um, Dr. Troller, sorry. We've had a question from Dr. Dossida, um, but that um, was a really great presentation and very comprehensive and the resources just look fantastic and I'm sure are going to be helpful for our Central Coast audience. So our first question that we've got for you is from Dr. Dossida. Um, he says that one problem can be the reliability of diagnosis, especially in those with moderate to severe intellectual dis disability. Do you have advice on how to approach where there is a disagreement between clinicians and agencies? That must be a common problem. I think it is. So thank you, David, for the question. Uh, it's not uncommon, particularly when people have very complex uh, mental health and physical health and uh, other related needs, for there to be ambiguity in the presentation. And this is something that I think people who uh, work in this specialised field know very well and um, are comfortable with, but we're aware that uh, it's, it's not, um, not always uh, uh, easy. I think the best guidance is probably to make sure that we're assessing people uh, on a continuing basis to actually try and resolve that diagnostic dilemma that we're using the resources available to us. And one, one example of that is uh, a service that you run that is supporting um, a statewide tertiary service. So referring to experts such as yourself, and there's a, um, a similar service for adults in New South Wales and making sure we get second opinions and others input to try and resolve that uh, difference. Um, but also, um, I think it's often the case that those who are expert or have a depth of knowledge in the field are in a position where they may need to advocate for the person. Uh, and it could be, for example, that in a um, 
uh, a local health district mental health context, the nature of the person's problems is uh, not well understood and the role of a specialist or an expert in the area is probably to help the local health district staff understand the nature of the problem and how to deal with it differently and also to how to tolerate that ambiguity. Um, you probably, uh, like me, believe that um, uh, in many situations, people are not getting access to the mental health supports they need simply because we get into this dispute over is it behaviour or is it a mental health concern? I think we should move beyond that. The person is presenting with distress. I think our services are gradually becoming more flexible and uh, are able to do that better, but sometimes we have to advocate for that to occur. Yeah, thank you. That's a great answer. And another question um, that we have is from Amy, from Amy Blackham. Do you have any suggestions to support further assessment if you suspect diagnostic overshadowing in care? Yes, I think this is a really important issue, Amy, and uh, I, I would highlight that uh, within local health districts now there is additional funding in many uh, local health districts uh, that has funded some clinical uh, staff. I think asking someone with some more experience to assess the person uh, or referring to one of the more specialised services that we've just alluded to would be really helpful in that context uh, because it's, it is relatively common to have that um, uh, overshadowing uh, situation. Thank you. That's, um, that's great. Um, Another question for you, and it's sort of about the diagnostic overshadowing, but it's more specific about an age group. Um, what about children or young people with intellectual disability and behaviour issues slash mental illness? How do you separate behaviour issues that might be normative, or do we have to separate them at all to successfully treat them? Yeah, so I think the good thing is that um, in children and younger people, there are more comprehensive services and many of these are multidisciplinary. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have comprehensive uh, developmental assessment services uh, across the state. And I think uh, we're in a, a situation in a rapidly changing um, uh, um, phase for the person uh, where things change quite quickly. But having a clear idea of what's uh, standard or the usual way that person may uh, respond and their behavioural profile is still a key, bearing in mind that at different stages, for example, during adolescence and during times of transition or change or increased stress, behaviours may escalate. Uh, so I think we must make sure, if possible, that the person is managed in a cohesive way, if possible, by the same uh, service so that a knowledge about them is built up, uh, records are kept, uh, and that we continue to make sure that behaviour and mental health is reviewed on a regular basis is probably the key. Um, if I had a child and adolescent psychiatry colleague here or a developmental paediatrician, they would probably be the sorts of people that I would lean on for extra advice in this area. Um, most of my practice is with uh, adults, uh, sometimes with adolescents, but not with younger people. Okay, thank you. Um, I imagine in that situation that carers and support people are really important for that sort of developmental history and for the you know the continuation of symptoms and and whatever their challenge is. So, I imagine there's a few people on this webinar that are not GPs and practitioners, but maybe some carers um, and support people as well. And so they're really important in that whole timeline of diagnosis, I imagine. So we have one more question. Um, is there more detail available regarding ED presentations for people with intellectual disability, specifically if self-initiated, um, family or carers or support services assisting with the ED referral. So does that make sense? Yeah, emergency department presentations, when we've looked at them at a whole across the state, are characterised, when you think about how they're different from uh, people without intellectual disability, as a person with disability, you're more likely to arrive by ambulance or by police. 
you're more likely to arrive as a result of a mental health concern or condition, uh, including a behavioural change, uh, and you're more likely to wait longer to be assessed and you're more likely to um, wait longer, uh, or have a longer uh, stay in the emergency department. Um, so there are some characteristics of those presentations that suggest a pathway and a, a, that it's not optimal for the person. Um, many people with intellectual disability live uh, independently and some live within uh, settings in the community where they're supported either by family or by um, uh, paid support workers. Um, in some situations, historically, it's been the case that if you have key events uh, within the, the um, disability accommodation where you're supported, that you must go to emergency. A typical, typical example of that would be, I've had a seizure uh, and I need to go into the emergency department. Uh, so that's another kind of common scenario is that there's a sentinel, sentinel event uh, for which a disability service provider needs a re medical review. Um, we've recently also looked at um, uh, presentations that are considered to be related to ambulatory care sensitive conditions. These are situations that should have been managed uh, within a general practice outside the acute care context, outside the hospital context. And we've seen that presentations to hospital and emergency departments uh, for uh, um, for ambulatory care sensitive conditions are way in excess uh, of that experience by the general population. So this tells us that uh, not only are people coming to emergency department uh, more often, but they're coming more often for reasons that should have been dealt with uh, way before presentation to emergency. And this means that we need to look uh, at optimising the clinical care of people with disability in primary care. This is one of the reasons that events like this are important. And I know that uh, Central uh, Coast recognise this as an area of need and uh, we, I know, can do a better job. Uh, so we must think about how we provide cohesive care in general practice for the person. Uh, we must make sure that we are regularly providing a comprehensive medical review an annual health assessment is absolutely mandatory, but we must make sure that we're proactively um, uh, addressing the preventative healthcare needs of people with disability, uh, that we are looking beyond the onerous task of the paperwork that it presents itself when a person with disability comes uh, to addressing the high mental health needs in that context, but also to be getting to things like basics, uh, screening uh, for uh, cardiometabolic um, risk factors uh, is underdone. We must make sure that we engage the person in discussions about uh, positive um, uh, steps they can take to support their own health and provide them with appropriate resources. We must make sure people are educated about um, diet, lifestyle, and we must refer people where we can to an appropriate dietitian or to a lifestyle intervention program or to an exercise physiologist to ensure that they do lose weight. And there's an increasing interest in uh, dietetics and in the exercise world uh, to make sure that uh, interventions are optimised for people with disabilities. So that's good news. We must make sure that we keep this uh, firmly on our agenda. Thank you. Um, we actually do have two more questions and I think we've got time plus to go over some of the resources that are local. Um, from Bridget, is there any baseline recording methods that would be best to implement in a support unit context to assist medical professionals? So I'm not sure I understand what a support unit context is. I'm assuming that it is a um, inpatient service, would that be right? Inpatient service? Yes, I think so, yeah. Okay, so if that's the case, uh, the A2D folder that I mentioned uh, is, is primarily geared for an inpatient setting. So that was developed by the COGRA uh, Developmental Assessment Service, a part of our own local health district, that has had a long-standing um, uh, role in building tools and helping support better practice. And through sheer experience of... Uh, supporting people through a hospital journey, they've re realised that a resource is needed that helps 
connect clinicians as they come into contact with a person in the inpatient unit with information about the person. So that A2D folder that I mentioned, admission to discharge folder is probably the best one that I can recommend for that. We've just had some clarification from Bridget to say it was an education unit context. Would that be the same sort of resource that would be useful? Ah, so no, in an education context, uh, I would primarily say uh, if you want a disability and mental health content, uh, the resources that are being produced by David Dossiter's group uh, uh, are excellent. And then for um, other age ranges, particularly for adolescents and adults, the e-learning resources that uh, we have developed that are free, as well as our competency toolkit, provide excellent ways of um, ensuring that you can develop professional development programs in those educational settings. Uh, so uh, there are certainly lots of ways you can use our competency toolkit. It's designed specifically uh, to enable you to do an audit um, and then to take steps to address uh, gaps that you have in your knowledge or um, practice. And there are all of the tools assembled there to do that. And then our e-learning uh, platform has just such extensive modules for health professionals, disability professionals, families and carers uh, uh, there uh, on all sorts of topics. Um, some of them, most of them mental health related, uh, some of them physical health related. Thank you, that, that's good. We have one more question and then we're going to go on to some local resources. This is from Michael. How do we manage cognitive decline in the setting of later life in intellectual disability, people with intellectual disability? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, we have a project that has um, really looked at this issue over a series of years, uh, has assessed uh, numerous people with intellectual disability serially over time uh, and we are currently developing uh, the final resources from that project. Uh, some of those will be specifically for uh, general practitioners. I was just reviewing a module that we're developing for GPs uh, to enable them to know what to do when a person presents uh, uh, with uh, potential cognitive decline in this setting. Uh, and also we've developed previous resources with Dementia Australia that are on their website uh, that are um, resources for families and carers uh, and we'll be developing resources for people with disability and families as part of this end product. Um, there are uh, assessment tools, but my view is that we need to make sure that uh, people with intellectual disabilities as, as their age have a very clear baseline uh, regarding their cognitive uh, function from which we can judge potential declines. Uh, knowing the baseline is really important and there are certain tools uh, that uh, we are recommending and the resources that we're developing uh, that are um, important baseline tools and then there are other rating instruments that are proxy um, forms so an informant can fill them out to detect change over time as well. So there are a number of resources. Um, none of them perform perfectly uh, but uh, some of them are reasonably good. Uh, there's a comprehensive diagnostic uh, interview that can be done with an informant about the person. Uh, and this is uh, one that's been developed in Cambridge in the UK where they've had a long standing um, fo research focus on dementia and people with intellectual disability. Uh, and I'm very happy to provide a list of potential resources if, if that's helpful. I've got them all on another slide set. Uh, we talk regularly about dementia and intellectual disability. If that's an interest to uh, the PHN and the local health district, I'm more than happy to um, do a much more comprehensive talk on that area because it's very big indeed. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure that is actually of uh, interest and we might speak to you about scheduling something for 2021 about that, that issue. Um, thank you, Dr. Schroller. That was really great. The questions were were great, so thank you for the to the participants and the answers were really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to show um, two slides that have been um, supplied by the PHN, um, and this is just about our local um, area resources and. We are actually developing more resources, so keep an eye on it. But the one health health site that we do have is called Health Pathways. And you'll see a slide now where it's got the login for the Central Coast area, the login and password, and also the login for the Hunter New England area, if we have any participants from that area. Um, that will be your best 
um, site for local resources and health pathways basically um, for people with intellectual disability and we are building more resources as time goes on so keep checking back into that area. Um, so we'll leave that, oh the next slide actually is for um, resources for people who are caring for people with intellectual disabilities and so there is some sites there that might be of interest to you. Um, we will be sending some resources with a follow-up email. Um, so we've nearly run out of time now. So basically the follow-up email will have um, an evaluation, which we'd love it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. There's also um, a question that we're interested in, uh, particularly from GPs, um, that might be interested in joining a community of practice around people with intellectual disabilities. So if you're interested in that, just let us know and um, the PHN will be in contact um, around connecting you um, about how that would work. Um, so there'll be an evaluation, there'll be a certificate, there'll be some links to some resources um, and also um, for other people that haven't uh, managed to attend, there'll be a recording of the event uh, on the People Bank site. So I think that's basically it. So thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you on the next of our series in February 2021 and we'll, you'll see an email from the PHN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, it was a real pleasure and really great information. So thank you so much.